Hello, welcome to Pommy Ponders Live. My co-host today, Jabby Joe, is running a little bit late. So, we'll start without him, so I'll let you all flittle through. Hope we're all doing really well. We're, we're two rounds in, but we're at round one. Eh? So, I'll let that sink in. Two rounds in at round one. That's bizarre, is it not? We've got a big, big show-filled extravaganza Today we're going to be covering round one. We're going to be covering Caleb Sarong's amazing week. We're going to talk about zero and two starts for the grand finalists. We're going to be talking about what is in vogue in football and looking ahead. Good day, Chills. Good day, Ro. How are you, my friend? And obviously we start off in the round one forecast. My blue boys, eh? My blue boys got over the line against a rugged, rugged, rugged Richmond side, eventually showing their class towards the end and running out winners by the skin of their teeth. But again, that's one of them weird ones, isn't it? The scoreboard will say five points. Much love, Blues for life. Good day, everyone. Good day, Daz, Paul, Kate, says Rowan, chills. The scoreboard will say five points, but I think it's probably fair to say in that fourth quarter, Carlton could have probably won that one by 20, 30, 40 points had they kicked a little bit more efficiently. But it's really nice to see. I think that it's weird how the media narratives change that, you know, everyone panned Collingwood and then everyone rewarded them towards the end of the year. Has to be said, Carlton's transition game, their ability to turn over and create interceptions without two of their best players at doing that in Walsh and Mr. Jacob Wheatering is a real refreshing sight. And one that I think going forward in round two, three, four, five, six as we go on is a really exciting sight because obviously that is the stat that is overplayed. The top sides in the in the football who win the premieres genuinely come back from that avenue in a top three in them departments. So I really enjoyed that. For Richmond, on the other hand, very impressed with how they negated it because clearance stoppage has never really been what you'd know them for. They've always been okay in that area. They, they really did give Carlton a trifle, and it was quite reassuring to see for a team that has to scrap, has to really work hard. They were very, very impressive, and they will be, they'll be okay for it. They're not going to be the worst side in the world. If they can repeat that performance, they're going to be all right. As for the Blues, though, it's eight points gained. Over two games, they get the week off. Some personnel should arrive, you would expect, in that interim as well, particularly uh, a young gentleman down the back, which is probably Carlton's weak area at the moment. They were susceptible, but they got away with it. And at the end of the day, as my granddad used to say about golf, a birdie is a birdie on the scorecard. They don't tell you about the scrub shot you got there. Good day, Jay Baggers. Good day on Brandy. Good day, James. Good friends of the channel. We move to Collingwood and Sydney. Sydney were very poor. Oh, Joe, look at this. Joe is a genius and he has missed the cow and talk as a proper Essendon fan. What a legend. Anyway, joining me tonight, great friend of the channel, great friend of mine. One of the most wonderful people I get to spend time with in YouTube. Joe from Centre Bounds. How are you, my friend? Bro, I am so good, and I'm also very, very sorry. My Facebook I've, was has been absolutely playing up this afternoon. I've had to log out and log in a few times to finally get in. It is an absolute pleasure to be here with you. I promise I didn't intend to miss out on the Carlton talk. I do enjoy talking Carlton. Uh, you might find it surprising. Your boys are always a very interesting point of contention. Either you're being praised by the media or you're getting lambasted. There's no middle. Uh, there's no middle ground. And I guess when you're a big Victorian club, it just goes a long way to getting all the clicks. I know all about it. We're linked to every single player every preseason. <laughs> well, let's see an Essendon perspective. I just finished talking about them saying that I think that the wonderful thing about Count at the moment is finding a new way to win, which has been that interception turnover game, which... Last year, Carlton were being lambasted for it. Was they're winning out of the clearance? They're the best side in the league. They can't score from turnover. They've taken that away from us the first games. Brisbane, brilliant at killing us there. Richmond, yep. surprisingly, killed us there. What have your thoughts? Do you think that that's something that makes us a threat? We've added a new layer. Oh, ab 
absolutely. Um, any way that you can find a way to win, to score a kick, kicking winning score and withhold your opponent from kicking a winning score, just go such a long way to to having the belief in yourself. It's not, it's not all just about the system. It's also having a belief in your teammates that even if things start to go off script, you're still able to back each other in, wrap your hands around each other and go, we got this, boys. We got this. We can take that next step. It doesn't matter what the challenges are in front of us because plans can go out the window. That, that Things can go chaotic. And we know, especially in the wet, for example, things can go chaotic, high pressure situation. People don't tend to think very clearly. It's very easy to, to succumb to that pressure. But when you look side by side and you still manage to get up, then that is absolutely incredible. Your performance last week was top notch. You came from the clouds, never gave up. You were obviously a bit down compared to last week. The first quarter was horrendous umpiring against you guys. Absolutely horrific. That was the only reason why Richmond were in it to begin with. That was shocking. You guys got robbed. I don't know how much Brennan Gale sent towards the umpires (laughs) that first quarter, but that money hit. Unfortunately, it ran out and they couldn't get over the top. But yeah, 100%, you should be really bullish with incredible players like Weedering and Walsh to come back. You're fine. And we talk about another a, a mutual common ground for an Essendon and a Carlton fan. Collingwood, um, reigning premiers, zero and two. Um, they've been lombasted in the press. Thank you, Mrs. Palm. Um, they've been lombasted in the press for Lee Matthews saying they've over celebrated calling it a popcorn moment. They do look re- They look the shell of the side. And we were just talking about Carlton. Teams know how to play us. Take away the corridor, take away the contest. Teams seem to have found a quick way to stifle pies and make them go into their gear five very early. And it looks a problem at the moment, doesn't it? I, I agree. I agree. It just seems to be... Yeah, hundred percent. It's it's that Tigers membership, man. That Tigers <laughs> membership. It. I don't know what Brendan Gale gave him. Look, I, Paul. I, I I'm not supposed to say this about about myself, but I think I consider myself a based supporter. I, I uh, whether it's heaping um, criticism at, at, at the players at the club, whether it be praising others that you know they deserve the praise, then. I'll just tend to say it as I see it. Now, and I do see that Collingwood does have some concerns. Absolutely. Collingwood, they really need to get their act into gear. But it's just the same old, same old where the premiers are the ones that are scrutinized and studied to oblivion. They're the ones that people have to try and beat. They're the ones that have the targets on their back. And that's why it's always so hard to go back to back. Um, and that's why we have the dynasties are so rare and you know far be- in between, so far and few between. So I do reckon that they're in for a tough time. I think the stats historically are really against them for any team that starts zero and two. Your chances of finishing top four substantially decrease, and that those those concerns are also leveled towards Brisbane Lions as well. So and because they really need to finish top four. Um, in order to have any chance of winning the flag. So, yeah, Collingwood need to get the act into gear. Um, they are being a little bit lackadaisical. I know I did see someone uh, was really aggressive against them for having that high five in the middle of the ground between Dugowie and someone else. I forgot who it was. When the ball was being rocketed towards their back line, like, work your ass off, mate. Go help out in defense. None of this high five nonsense in the middle of the ground when you're about to lose. So, they do look very comfortable, and I love it because I hate Collingwood with an absolute passion. Do you think, and Brian says, obviously the, the talk is they're a one-trick pony, that that high energy. And we saw, I, I thought last year we saw St Kilda. They came very close when they were on their little streak. I thought St Kilda, I thought Ross did the right idea, make them yep. burn energy. Do you think a big part of Collingwood's success last year was they were written off. So that game style is great when you're hunting, but now yeah. everyone's got that passion to beat you. You're the hunted. And it feels like it, I, the first two games for me felt like there was a spark missing. They didn't play angry. And before, they seemed to be an angry football side. Now it feels like they're struggling to adapt to being the hunted. Yeah, uh, it was so funny trying to see JB Brayshaw 
try and say every time Collingwood got a goal, oh, here come the pies in the last quarter. Yeah, I mean, everyone hates Collingwood. I have, I have an ABC policy, anyone but Collingwood. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, I, I found it hilarious that Brayshaw was doing all he can to try and make us feel like Collingwood were coming back. But anybody with eyes could tell Sydney were all over him. They absolutely destroyed them. They do want to be that, to have that underdog status. And I think that's also part of the way that Craig McRae likes to conduct himself as a really likable guy, you know, giving nice, likable answers, trying to make Collingwood likable, trying to barrack for the comeback. But no one's having any bar of it this year. We want, everyone wants to see Collingwood lose. Congratulations. You got your 16th. But no one wants to see him go back to back, obviously, apart from their own supporters. And I've got no issues with... I'm actually going to tip the Saints to win this week. I'm backing Ross and this angry-looking St. Kilda side who really took it up to the Cats in Geelong. I can see him causing an upset. And I would be... In, I'd be yes, Peter 5, Peter V, Blue Bagger. Yes, imagine the... Owen 3. Owen the Saints. Send them to <laughs> Owen 3. Let's go. And what do we think of Sydney? Like, I think Sydney, I was quite bullish on them in the preseason. I've seen him so far. Isaac Heaney looks like he's, well, at the moment, he's probably winning the Brownlow, isn't he, at the moment? Oh. But the, the synergy already with Grundy in that midfield, they've got aces all around the ground. And both games, I thought Sydney look the real deal. And yeah. there's nothing that's set. It looks like they're playing angry as well. They've got a real spark. If they stay fit and healthy, they could be re- go real deep. Because they bat real deep as well. You know, you take you take out Mills, you take out Parker, you take out Adams, and yet they're still doing incredibly well around the ball. They're still getting the ball inside their forward 50. Heaney has looked absolutely unreal. We've heard it time and time again. How many pre-seasons now have we heard it from Horst Longmire that he's going to get more increased midfield minutes? Well, thankfully for him, the injuries in that midfield mix has forced him to play there. And now you think to yourself, geez, if Horst is going to be one real stubborn mule, not a horse, if he takes Heaney out of that midfield mix um, and puts him forward of the ball because he has looked wonderful. I agree. He should. He's got three votes. In back-to-back weeks, absolute superstar. I got him on my super coach team, and I'm living life to the fullest at the moment. Very happy with Isaac Heaney. Uh, I know Brad Scott tried to liken Archie Perkins to him, and I'm like, bro, don't freaking do that to the young man. Heaney's on another level. Well, we talk about your bombers. I, I actually thought this was the tie of the round. Like this was a really, as a neutral, it was entertaining. This both ways. I thought Hawks showed a little bit of heart. You could see they were depleted, though. But I thought, a bit like Carlton in this one, you were meant to win, but you eventually found the gear. And by the fourth quarter, we saw there was the golf in class. And you mentioned Archie Perkins. He's another one, a bit like Harley Reid, who in his draft year, every article seemed to be negative about him. We know there was that rumour his mum didn't want him to leave, which was dispelled. But... He looks real sore, but Essendon, dare I say it, under Brad Scott, looking sexy at times. They play a very rambustious style of football, don't they, compared to what you expect from Brad Scott, which is slow and measured. Yeah, because we don't have the ball users in order to really play that slow and measured. We don't. We didn't have Jordan Ridley, who's one of our better kicks. Mason Redman, I think, really lowered his colours uh, in the game and I think Brad Scott sort of knew that, which is why we didn't uh, go to appeal that one-week suspension. I think it was a real – yeah, it's, it's he's super clean, Daniela. I agree. He's a, and he's a handsome man already. He doesn't need to add a screen to it as well. So you're, you're, talking, se- you're talking sexy football. We've got a sexy streamer right here, mate. What are we talking about? But, yeah, I, there were definitely a lot of red flags about the way we played. Obviously really happy that we got the result. Um, But the Hawks really blew a lot of wide open chances in front of the big sticks to to really punish us um, and make our lives a little bit more difficult. I think some of the recruits that we had really played a really important role. I thought Mackay had a really good um, showing against Lewis in the back line. I think Gresham really worked very hard. 
I was really, I thought this was a real danger game coming into it because I just respect, as much as I hate Sam Mitchell with a passion, I respect him as a coach incredibly highly. And the way they ended their season last year was really impressive. So I thought it was a danger game. It was dangerous for a time, but you're right. At the In, in the end, I was pleased with our conditioning, being able to run over the top in the last quarter. And the difference in age and experience between the two teams isn't that great. You just take you take Goldie out of there and you put Draper in, and all of a sudden the team looks almost identical in terms of the age and experience profile. So I still consider us a young side. I think that's fair. I mean, I think one thing that the Hawks will take from it and you is they blooded your nose a few times, but you rose to the challenge, which we've seen. I, I'm a Carlton fan. We've played the baby Hawks a couple of years ago where we absolutely ran over the top of them and then they did what they did to you. They blooded your nose and we didn't have the maturity and the game sense to keep them like you guys did four goals away. We we kind of made it a scrap. But Hawthorne will look at that game and they got dominated by you guys in the centre and they were incredibly inaccurate. But I think there's a lot of hope for the Hawks. They'll look at that game, they'll watch that tape and go, we're not miles away though. Even with the outs they had, they had a lot of outs in that back line. Uh, they had to, and they don't want Sicily playing that role. They want Sicily playing as that interceptor, generator off half back. And to their credit, yeah, again, Ginevan looked incredible. He was tearing us apart, um, and they did look great for for portions of the game. Uh, absolutely, it's a glass half full for the Hawks. They're not expecting to challenge this year anyway. Um, but speaking about bloodied nose, I actually like that this Essendon team had the mongrel, I suppose, in them to go after uh, Sicily at the start of the game. They pointed out, this is the skipper. This is their most important player. We're going to go after him. We're going to get under his skin. He's prone to getting angry and getting suspended. We're going to challenge him. And I thought it really was a great way for us to start the game and put us in the right mental state. So uh, I'm positives. For both teams, um, obviously, their injury concerns are an issue. We'll rectify it when they get their personnel back. But I'm hoping we can improve our transition defense, which continues to be lacking, unfortunately. I'm not very optimistic about this week against the Swans. Let's just say that. It's going to be a tough game. It's going to be interesting to see what Hawks do as well. We know Sicily this week. I mean, that that they're probably a couple of a couple more injuries from giving me a call and asking if I want to play down back for him. Yeah, I know, right? Don't, they're not they're not going to give me a call because they know I hate Sam Mitchell and I'll do everything I can to sabotage their team. But um, <laughs> yeah, no, they did they did really well. Um, and I I'm not sure Collingwood are particularly missing Ginevan at this point in time. Um, He's a good footballer, but I do think, I don't know, personally, I think he's a little bit overrated. I definitely, if you're going to compare him to the Wizard, I think the Wizard's going to be twice the footballer he is for his career. And uh, three behinds for the Wizard this game. He could have really set set it on fire, uh, but I can forgive him. There were some pretty tough shots in the pocket. One hit the post as well. Would have absolutely blown the roof off the MCG. I've got to say... On the wizard, I, I I got Cyril Rioli vibes, mm. just just because he was in the right place at the right time. And on another day, we're talking about eighteen points. He's won the game. Do you know what I mean? Yep. Like in another game, he could have taken that game away. Yep, hundred uh, percent. They they've got an absolute wonderful player there, the Hawks. They, they knew what they were going for. They had him in their sights. And, um, I mean, Sam Mitchell sort of spoke about it in the post-game uh, conference as well, that he saw how important the smalls were in the in the final series. They're the ones that popped off. Uh, it was a small forward that won the Norm Smith. And we've seen what happened with even the Giants. The Giants recruited to a couple of small forwards as well this year. So it's those great small forwards are worth their weight in gold. Um and yeah, I, I agree with Laughing Magpie. There's a bit of Stephen Milne in there, but he has to be a bit more of a pain in the ass. Um, didn't completely show it in his first game, but from what I've heard, apparently he can be really sneaky. Both him and Ginevan are going to get under a lot of people's skins, apparently. Well, we love the wizard around these parts, so I'm looking forward to seeing him. And you mentioned GWS there, probably the most impressive side this year. And 
you want to see someone put sides to the sword. They they were incredibly impressive. And I've got to say, I didn't think North were that bad. Like, they started that game, and I was like, oh, hello. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. There's, there's a bit of Clarko about this North side, but I suppose the story is Jesse Hogan thinking it was his debut year. He looked sensational, and it just shows you what a good environment and a positive approach can do for him because Jesse Hogan looked like the Melbourne Hogan. Yeah, it's. I don't think you'll find a single lover of football be upset with what we're seeing from Jesse Hogan. He has been absolutely wonderful. And it, I think the Giants are just, they've got, they're, they're developing a wonderful culture. I think they've already got one, not that they're developing. I think they've reached it. They've got a great culture where they can get around and support and help mature someone like a like a Toby Green, for example, who I know you and Riles were speaking about him last week um, in your in your episode. They have this wonderful culture where they can get the best out of each other. They don't lack for anything. Everyone backs each other in, and I, I think Kingsley is an is a wonderful coach. These guys, yeah, I mean, you've got to seriously consider them for the flag this year um, in those in those considerations. So, man. They, they were so efficient and they took advantage of all those injuries in the North Melbourne back line perfectly. They shared the love, whether it's Hogan, whether it's Brown, whether it's Cadman, Riccardi, so many threats in that forward line that can take a mark. And then you've got, they're introducing even youngsters like Harvey Thomas, for example, who I thought had some great glimpses and flashes. Bedford, very smart pickup from Melbourne. They, they're just stacked, man. <laughs> well, it's, it's crazy because they seem to be the team. They seem to be the team, don't they, that have so many players. They trade so many players out, but they instantly replace them. They've got an uncanny ability. And two guys I wanted to talk about who have come under a lot of criticism. And I was quite happy to see them because they were both in my AA mock. Canelio and Whitfield finally coming back to some form. And Stephen Canelio, I might hate him still because he danced with Carlton. I can't stand the Dybala celebration, but... <laughs> they they dominated and Mr. Tom Green, he looks like it's his midfield which has freed Whitfield and Canelio to be the creative juices while Tom Green goes and incredible hulks that midfield. That's really good to see them back to form. Oh, they've they've got Daniela, I uh, I'm happy to come on every time, any time that this great man would like me to come on. Absolutely. I, I love you. As you can, t who, who can get sick and tired of talking to this man? Seriously, you, you can't, you just can't. So, um, but much love, Danielle. I really appreciate the beautiful compliment. But yeah, speaking of compliments, man, that midfield mix, they complement each other so damn well. Like they've, they've got, they've got that mix of inside and outside. And we, we see a lot of teams tend to either be too inside or too outside. It's very rare to have that, almost perfect balance. And I agree with you, Brian. They definitely, I think, should have been Collingwood. I think they were really hard done by with the fact that they had to travel around so much. Um, I think they won in 17 different venues last year. Um, we never get, yeah, exactly, man. 100%, 100%, Jason. So uh, I love the Giants. They're my second team. Um, I know you're not supposed to have a second team, but bloody hell, they are my second team. They're so damn good to watch. And the orange tsunami is back, uh, but better, um, if you know what I mean. Everyone is committed. Everyone is doing it. It's not just a few players here and there. It's a full team wave. And we're seeing the best of Lockie Whitfield. He's had some injury concerns. They've, they've ticked him around with his role a little bit. But, man, they have <sighs> elixir from the gods this mixture that they've got going on right now. It's tough to see him lose. And we've got to give North a bit of kudos. I did enjoy Colby McKercher's debut. I was hot on him in the draft that I thought he was pick one. And I yeah. was like, if he was my, if I had pick one, he's a guaranteed thing. Talking about a guy that you hate, he reminds me so much of Sam Mitchell. The fact that he can do everything. He just hits target after target. He's very calm and assured. They have got a really good young midfield. They've just got to blood it, really, and take the medicine. For times, I thought they handled Green quite well, Tom Green, who is a nightmare matchup 
They they didn't look the baby North Melbourne that we thought they were. They'll win games this year. I watched that game and thought yeah. they'll win games. They'll beat teams sure. that are a little bit under par. Hundred um, percent. If you're not switched on in this in this league, you can lose. I mean, last last year, freaking West Coast beat the Western Bulldogs. I mean, who could possibly see that? Tassie Devils, mate. Congratulations to them. But bloody hell, that jersey is disgusting. I don't know. I, I, I like it's the, the logo, but the T is no good. Um, it, it does not fit them to a T. I must. You say. know, controversial. But, um, I think hmm. the logo, instead of it being here, should have been on the T. Yes. Yes. I agree. Oh, Paul Hill, gifting memberships. You're an absolute superstar, Paul. He's well done. Paul, he's done um, it again. Much as gracias. So the 10 of you guys and girls in chat will get to watch the special live stream a bit later this week. Um, so stay tuned for that. Thank you, Paul. You are a wonderful support. We go from the horrible side, for two horrible sides, to two sides that are probably on the outside of the eight in most people's predictions, Geelong and St. Kilda. Um, this was a game that I thought taught us a lot, a lot about where St. Kilda are, but also a lot about don't sleep on Geelong because mm. this was vintage flag-winning Geelong of just being ruthless when they needed to be. And they're a team that I think, if they can stay fit and fire in, They've got that great blend of young players. Dempsey was fantastic. We oh, know how wow. good Jeremy Cameron is. We know Oliver Henry works hard. But a team that could probably beat just about anyone in that if they stay fit, especially at home, uh, it's such a it's such a tough venue to win at. They 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 play the the ground to perfection because there's no other ground like it. I've likened it to a runway. The, the ground might as well just be a rectangle for all we care because the, the, there are no wings there. It's almost it's almost legit a runway. Just straight up there, fly away, my boys. But uh, I thought St. Kilda really showed some incredible hearts, really. I think the Saints can take a lot out of that game. Yeah, we know Geelong and Geelong's a tough task, um, tough assignment, but I think the Saints can look at it and say, wow, that stocker free kick against the danger field probably really wasn't there. It's a very soft free kick, I would imagine. I don't think Dangerfield was anywhere near winning the ball. Um, stocker gets injured, free kick to danger, kicks the goal, Bob's your uncle. Um, but they had some wonderful youngsters. I mean, Darcy Wilson. I thought Darcy Wilson had a great game. Kicked a real clutch goal at the end there, kept his nerve, didn't blaze away. I think, the, as we know, I think it seems, yeah, the Saints like to play a bit more slingshot footy because they now have the outside talent. Liam Henry was great. Uh, Riley Bonner was a decent acquisition, but they're really lacking another gun midfielder inside. Uh, and I think that might be the thing that holds them back because Rowan Marshall is a great ruckman. I think they need to get a bit more out of him at ground level, get some more clearances going their way because I do think they're lacking in the midfield in order to win some clearances. Geelong just had their own way in the middle. It was it was great to see Jack Steele back to his best, but I agree. Yeah. I watched that game and I was like, if you put a George Hewitt in that St. Kilda team, mm. we're talking flag. We're talking flag because Wanganine Mawera might be, in my opinion, the best draft pickup of all time. That kid... Everyone talks about Sheasel. Everyone talks about Nick Dacos. I think just the tier below Nick Dacos, you'll find Wanganin. And he is sensational. Like, I was watching him thinking, him at the G in this game, he mm. would tear it up. Yep. Yep, 100%. Uh, I saw it coming. I, I love Naz. Um, he's, he's a wonderful, wonderful player. I actually started him in Supercoach last year. A little bit premature. Uh, but it's because I just know uh, what a talent he is. So classy, so silky. He's got decent height on him as well. I love watching him play. Um, adding, you know, Hill can run through there. He's a bit, he's pretty dynamic. Him and Henry, um, they've really got some outside weapons. Sinclair to come back into the side this week as well. So they do have a lot of run and gun. Now to this Ross Lyon team that they didn't have before which I think will only be beneficial to the likes of King, who really gets 
more opportunities, one out. Good luck beating him in a one-on-one -on -one contest once he gets those massive telescopic arms out. You're chopping his arms and you're giving away a free kick or he's taking a mark. So getting more speed on the ball will absolutely help them. And at ground level, they've got players like Higgins, for example, that can feast up and, um, and lap up those crumbs. So uh, really pleased with this development in their game style for St. Kilda. It's good to see, just seeing, like you say, that quicker ball movement's only going to benefit their assets. And Max King, he he, he had such a nearly game, didn't yeah. he, this game? Like, there's another there's another world out there where Max King kicks 10. And yep. we're lauding him as the second coming of Lockett. He, he, he looks deadly. And that was good to see because I, I, I've got a soft spot for Saints because of my wife. Always will have a soft spot for him. Yeah, fair enough. I mean, he's he's great. Uh, with a lot of talent on his on his shoulders, uh, a lot of responsibility on his shoulders, and he can't help but feel that if that was Harry Mackay, for example, um, he'd be under a lot more scrutiny this week. Exactly, I agree. I, I do think if that if Max King played for Carlton, we'd be having a different conversation. But talking about different conversations, everyone, every man and his dog for Adelaide were flag winners, right? <laughs> Right, everyone did. Even I did. Even I got way too excited about uh, about uh, Adelaide. But Gold Coast under Dimmer, that resurgence continues. And you know what was amazing is this was a tale of two young sides going hammer and tongs and the sexy football of Adelaide being undone by just real brute force and determination. And Matt Rowell looks like he did in his rising star year before he got injured. Him and Noah Anderson look world class. And I'm watching Gold Coast now, and I'm a believer. I'm a believer. Mate, nothing is more impressive on a football field than brute force. Like, you, you can have sexiness and plans and... You can do any of that. But in the face of brute force, it all just drops away like paper mache because at the end of the day, football can be quite simple. You win the ball at the source, you get your field territory, and you let your forwards get to work. Sometimes you can overcomplicate it. And in the face of such overwhelming clearance contested brutality from Matt Rowell, the goat, he's eating grass at the ground. And it's giving him powers. He's he's like the Popeye of, of of football, except he's not eating spinach. He's eating AFL turf, and for some reason, it's converting his um, his ability to to actually perform, taking it to another level. And they've given him more center bounces. They've kept it limited to the four mids. It's Raul, it's Anderson, it's Took Miller, and it's Sam Flanders. They're keeping these four in there. Um, Dimmer Hardwick knows the assets that he's got to work with and he has unleashed them to go balls to the wall. They are they're making finals this year. That's a bold call. And Paul asked the question about the King Bros. It's really weird, isn't it? When you watch Max King versus Ben, you can see that even though they're brothers, there's different skill sets. And it's interesting to watch Ben. He doesn't seem to like that contested one-on-one -on -one stuff, does he? He, he seems to really need the perfect ball where you watch max king some of the contests he goes for a stupid almost yep. he's but where ben seems to be a little bit more measured this is probably the one question mark i have about gold coast that both lacocious and ben king who they've deployed deep with levi casbolt being the auxiliary they haven't really set the world alight yet and it feels like if they had a key forward that could keep 50 they would be in the conversation for me. I think a bit of that timidness has got to come from a lack of complete confidence and belief in his body. He's had a he's had quite a few interruptions to this to the start of his. Um, I'm sure it's going to be a wonderful career, um, but he's had to start slow. He's had to bide his time, trying to get in and and get some continuity into his game. And I can see that as he continues to to build as a body, get more games under his belt. I think he's going to really feel like he belongs and then he can build that confidence in his body. Do think that he's still a wonderful set shot for goal. They've had a couple of wins at home and I think it's going to be a real fortress for him. 
those conditions, the dewiness, the slip, the slippery ball in the evening with their contested beast of a midfield, plus Jared Witts is a very serviceable ruckman as well. He doesn't do a, he doesn't do a lot of things around the ground, but all he has to do is put the ball to ground in the ruck contest and let his midfield go to work, and they are really good at doing that. So I imagine that the conditions might play a big role in that tall forward line being unable to dominate. But as long as they can bring the ball to ground, they've got players like Matt Roses, for example, who I think doesn't get enough credit um, as a really silky um, ground level player. They've got, they've got Holman, for example, who's a real go getter as well. So I do think that the, at the, the Suns have a lot of assets and they're all just going to flourish under Dimmer Hardwick if they can get a, if they can pinch a couple of wins away from home would be incredible but i think they're making their home ground a fortress this year and that goes a long way to making the top 8 well they do have a challenge in a team that is in strife melbourne absolutely pulled apart the doggies and i'm actually quite happy about this i never smile at someone's misfortune but i did have a doggies fan who went mental that i had them 12th in my preseason and said i underestimated them and the doggies Look in a world of hurt. And this was, yep. they were beaten just about everywhere on the pitch. And I mean, Clayton Oliver took the fourth quarter off and the game was wrapped up. The dogs yep. look completely limp. And I'm going to go bold now. I don't even think Beveridge makes the bye. Yep. Yep. 100%. And it's about goddamn time to. One of the worst coaches in the league. How the hell has he managed to stay in that coach's box for this long? It is absolute. Him and Goodwin are both really shit coaches. I'm just going to put it out there. Um, and I, uh, I'm sorry. I know. I'm 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 backseat coaching here from my from my house in front of my green screen. I'm like, come on, Joe, you do any better? But I honestly reckon my dad could do better, and he doesn't even speak complete English. Like honestly, the the. the Putting, the, putting these players in these ridiculous situations, subbing out Riley Sanders. Like, bro, what are you doing? He is off absolutely off his peanut. Send him to the psych ward. He's needed to go there years ago. It's long overdue. The radio's not talking to you, mate. It's legit just an apparatus. Turn it off and it'll stop talking to you. So now Bevo's gone, bro, and he can't go quick enough. It it was it was sad to see because the second half, you saw Killer Windsor go on the ball. Like in Melbourne, kind of treated that second half like it was a practice game because yeah. they were trialing new things, and that's what really concerned me. Because that's I've never seen that happen to Carlton where someone kind of treats it Mickey Mouse. It felt like they were treating them like they were wooden spooners. And I agree. I thought Sanders was one of the few highlights for me with the Doggies. Yep. When I was watching that game, I was like, if I'm a Doggies fan, wow, at least he's playing some good football. And then to sub him off when I felt like this is where you let him out there and say, this is what you're going And another worry for me, and I know no one's covered this, Bonapelli isn't getting younger, right? No. And people always forget about this. With all the compromised drafts, and I've said this for a while now, I wouldn't be surprised to see Bontapelli be linked with teams. And we've just mentioned the lack of St. Kilda's inside. With Tasmania coming in soon, we know draft picks are going to be a commodity. I wouldn't be surprised to see someone come in for Bont because... Let's be honest, 2016, he won't really remember that premiership. He wasn't the superstar he is today. He deserves to lead a team into a flag. And if I'm St. Kilda, I'm selling the farm to pair in with Steel. Mate, if you are any team, you're selling the farm, the factory, um, the, the middleman, the people who drive the trucks there. You're selling DFO. All of DFO, you're selling it all in order to get Bonds and Pelly. The guy is an absolute... Superstar, best player in the league, in my opinion. I know you probably reckon still Charlie Kono, but I think uh, it's close. It's very close. But I think Bont and Pelly is an absolute superstar, and he will he will fit in seamlessly anywhere, and he will make the team better. He's such a great ball user, can push forward, take a mark, hit the scoreboard. There is nothing this man can't do on the footy field. And yeah, if the if the Saints 
really want to go all the way, mate. 1.2 mil for Bont, as Brian here says, mate. Send it all. Full send. Um, go over salary cap if need be, and you will find that St. Kilda will finally be adding a second flag to their cabinet. It's going to be interesting. I mean, 2028, that's what, four years? It'll be 32. He'd be one of them. I mean, McRae is definitely one as well that you're looking at as well. He's he's another reason that I fell out with Beveridge last year when I started saying, yep. why are you sacking him? Because for me, I know we're in the generation now where people slag off Nick Dacos, even though he went 50% contested possession for the other week. But every team has a guy that gets 30, 40 possessions, right? For me, McRae and Bontapelli go together like, Ebony and Ivory, like the Carpenters. Yep. You've got to have them together. John Lennon, Paul McCartney. It, it's weird that he's they lamped him half forward flank last year. And the rumours this year are they want to play him in the back half of the ground. Beveridge has gone gaga. And he's got he's got Caleb Daniel as the sub. He's got Caleb Daniel as the sub, who I'm sure many other clubs would be very happy. To, to have Caleb Daniel in their team. He's got him as a sub. He subs out Sanders over a guy like Gallagher, who clearly had knee issues being assessed. Now, nah, we'll take out the perfectly healthy Riley Sanders and keep the one with the injury concern to his knee in Gallagher in, on the field, for example. Like, he, I really worry that Flan, that I'm um, not Flanders, sorry. I really worry. I hope Sanders can bounce back from this because his coach really let him down by subbing him out. I hope he doesn't go into his shell with shot confidence. Um, I really hope he comes back next next week and, and really just goes absolutely bananas. Um, but, yeah, nah, Bevo's, Bevo's, a, Bevo's a loose unit. No idea what he's doing. And uh, I think the sooner he goes, now I know you mentioned the Carpenters. It's only just begun. And I think the, <laughs> I, I, I think the pressure on him has only just begun. He's the pressure's going to continue mounting every week, mate. And uh, chills here. I agree. Ash Hansen being moved to the coaching box as the tactician, former, former, former doggy coach. It does worry me because genuinely, when you get that senior assistance position, it's only a matter of time. You know the player, though. You know, we're talking about Bevo, a guy that Chiricella. Whatever happened to him? He was linked with every job. I know he's at your mob. He's meant to be a tactical genius. Um, that noise has died pretty quickly, hasn't it? Mate, we've we, we've kept him under wraps. We've told him it's all right. Calm down. <laughs> We're keeping you happy. We're giving him massages every morning. His seat has got a nice little seat warm uh, for his butt. Keep it nice and warm in the seat. We bring him coffees everywhere. We're doing our best to to keep him uh, to keep him at the club. <laughs> well, Petra talks about Inkley, and we go on to their club. Another guy that's probably, I'd say he coaches the serial bridesmaids, doesn't he? They're always the uh, always the bridesmaids of pot. And you know what? This is going to sound barmy, so I'm going to say it. For, I yes. would say one of the worst 50 point wins I have ever seen because I thought Port's accuracy in front of goal was nothing short of barbaric, and I would say at least 10 of the 16 goals against a good side, you ain't getting them looks anyway. I looked at Port here, and even though they dominated, and I know the media are going to go mental about Rosie and Butters, I was thinking they won't get this anywhere else because I thought West Coast were basically a glorified under-19s team. Like, I, I thought they were appalling, and I actually thought 50 points flattered Eagles. It didn't flatter Port. I agree. I wholeheartedly agree. And I know we had a lot of question marks over Port's recruitment strategy this year, really filling up their team with a bunch of B graders. You know what I mean? So it's um, it's a little bit surprising. They, they clearly think they're in the window and they clearly think they're a genuine chance of winning the flag. But I don't think BZT is going gonna, is gonna to be that missing link to get them over the top. I don't think um, Radical Lee is going to be... I mean, he's a he's a decent player, but I just don't think that the makeup is particularly going to be strong. Um, and I can see them I can see them making finals and dropping out in straight sets yet again. I just don't see how they get the job done. Um, 
I'm not entirely sure how serious they took the game. I know Ollie Wines spent quite a bit of time on the bench, um, and he's normally one of their contested ball winners now that he's fully fit and things like that. I, I agree. I definitely took a lot, took a lot out of the West Coast Eagles. But yeah, even role players. Yeah, 100% Paul. Like B graders, C graders, role players. Like, I'm not entirely sure what how we're categorizing them here in the AFL, but I don't really think that they're I don't think they're genuine flag contenders at all. And I honestly reckon the Danny Stingrays, Daniel Stingrays could, could beat this West Coast side. Uh, but they're played with heart um, at Adelaide Oval as well, which is normally a fortress for them. So, look, I think there's uh, there's a bit to work with, with the Eagles moving forward. I, I thought, you know, I, I watched this game and the bits that I did enjoy is I loved to see some of their younger players. I really did enjoy how hard they were. This game, they were destined to lose, weren't they? Let's be honest. Yeah. Like, yes. I don't think anyone, even the most diehard West Coast fan, came into this game and said, we're a sniff. But that's where I have the question marks and part because I thought Waterman's goals and Petricelli, they were easy. They were training ground goals that were yep. scored in the first half when the game was kind of up for debate. It was a non-event in the second half. So I watched that game and thought... Harley Reid looks sensational. As he grows, he'll be a very good footballer. But I looked at Port and I was like, I agree with you. I, I always say your list needs to be 70% role players. But I genuinely think, I, I, I'd i say Butters is an elite role player. I, don't, I, th I think he's like George Hewitt. He's the guy that holds everything together. Rosie's your X factor. Outside of Rosie, no disrespect to Port. I don't look at their team and shit myself. I I, I no. think stop Rosie, batter Port. Oh, look. When I see Dan Houston, I shit myself. Um, PTSD. Um, but other than that, you're right. I mean, Charlie Dixon, he ain't a threat. He looks threatening, but he's not really threatening. You know what I mean? Like, he's, he's not... I don't think he's one of those genuinely dangerous key forwards. As much as he tries to be, um, if you're gonna, if I was to pick either him or you know coming out from um, or Oscar Allen, for example, from the Eagles, I, I'm 100% taking Oscar Allen every day of the week and twice on Sunday. So I definitely think there's a bit more to work with uh, with the Eagles. Elliot Yo. You know, hopefully he can continue to stay fit and on the park. And I thought he was okay for, for parts of it, but I did like the pickup of Jaden Hunt. I think he's really provided them with a lot of run coming out of Melbourne. Um, a, a shrewd pickup there. And, you know, there, there's a bunch of players over there at, at the Eagles that I think are going to have pretty decent careers. And we know from history that the Eagles are really good at bouncing back from, um, from rebuilds. So I can see them continue to, to lift. Mate, I agree. And we finish the round. Jermaine, we finish the round with a massive game. And I owe Fremantle fans an apology because I said, on paper, Fremantle might be the worst side ever fielded with the most, most plaudits. Um, harsh. Wow. <laughs> I was proven wrong. Um, an absolute grindy performance at the Optus Stadium. And, Caleb Sarong at times was in danger of beating beating Glenn McGrath's top scorer in Test cricket, wasn't he? With touches, Fremantle. Honestly, I'm glad I'm wrong. They absolutely pulled Brisbane apart. And you know yeah. what? Question marks. It's very early in the season, but Brisbane seem to struggle when it's taken to them. We see it in the finals. We see it in regular seasons. Carlton did it. Now Fremantle did it. Teams know these, these, this team shit themselves under pressure. It's always been an issue. Oh, night, Kate. Thanks for coming on. Um, yeah, we've seen it time and time again with the Brisbane Lions. Just that lack of that lack of clutch factor about them, and they've given up quite a few leads where they've been in commanding positions in the last quarter, and they've just you know fallen apart. And I can't help but feel that some of that has to go on the coach. I know every now and then, if something ha if it happens once or twice, then you can say, all right, this is a player, a personnel issue. But when we see it time and time again, it's like, how hard are you guys actually training this? How 
effectively are you practicing this? Um, you know, I just can't help but feel that Chris Fagan, he's a great coach. He's got them to this point. He's helped to transform the club, but I can't help but feel that they need someone maybe potentially a little bit more ruthless to get them over the line and to take out that niceness from them um, and to give them a harder edge. Because I think they have players that can push the envelope. I do think they have players that can really um, take that next level. And I can't help but feel that currently with the way they are, they're not a genuine threat of winning the flag. Yes, they came in without Lockie Neal, who's a really important player in their midfield, but they got destroyed. They just comp- they never looked likely. You see, when I look at their midfield, I know everyone's saying, oh, there was no Neal and stuff like that, but I think when you're going into that midfield with McCluggage, Dunkley, Jared Lines, you've got Zorko flinging through their clog, Barry's experience... They've still got world-class stars. Do you know what I mean? Like, all them players would play in the 18 of just about other sides. And I'm with you. You know, my worry is, I always look at this. If you told me Hitwood and Danaher scored six between them and said, guess the score, I would have said Brisbane by 50. <laughs> Do you know what I mean? Like, if you told me... Hit Wood and Danaher, six goals between them. Yep. I'd be like, yep. okay, cool. They, they, they've won that game quite comfortably then. Yep. Yep, 100%. They're, and they've got other great contributors, um, like Zach Bailey. He's an he's a X-Factor. He's a very classy operator. Lincoln McCarthy, he's, he's capable of playing taller than he is with some incredible leaps and bringing the ball to ground and just flipping a contest on its head. Obviously, we don't have to talk about Country Roads, Cameron, um, but it's they, they have so many threats, and yet they struggled with their ball movement. They struggled with their connections. And I actually agree with Paul Hill's comment. Coleman, Kadeen Coleman, he went out against you boys, and they fell apart. They didn't come into it into this game. They got they had Connor McKenna back, but Connor McKenna is not Kideen Coleman. He is so important for them behind the ball with his great ball use. I thought that over the preseason they might work on having the the load be spread across and rather than being dependent so much on one player, especially someone as injury prone as he is. But far out, I just can't help but feel that this was a really wasted preseason. And they look like they're doomed to miss the top four now. It's an interesting one. I agree with you, with, with especially on the terms of, you know, Kitty Coleman. Like, because replacing McKenna with Kitty Coleman is like replacing Robbie Williams as a singer with Robin Williams. Do you know what I mean? It, it, it's, it, it kind of does the job, but it's not the right tool, is it, for a Rest job? In Rest in peace. Rest in peace. And I was watching I was watching their back line, and it looked limp. But then I was watching their midfield, and I I agree Neil's a good player. But, you know, like I was maybe harsh on Zach Butters earlier, saying I just think he's an elite role player. I don't think Zach Butters wins you a game. I don't think Neil is the kind of guy that wins you that game. I think Neil's the icing on the cake. He's the superstar. So that's what really worries me when I watch Brisbane, that if it's that easy to beat them by putting pressure and stifling them, what do you think Collingwood last year did? They destroyed them. What do you think Carlton did? Carlton didn't play particularly well. They won that game. I, I, I think Brisbane could be one of the sides that may drop out of even the eight if this continues. It's because you you would expect, given their history and their track record and the fact that the Gabba is just an absolute fortress, that you are penciling in these wins that you would normally give to them and that would put them in the line for a top four finish. But if they're now starting to lose these games, which you would normally pencil in, I mean, how many times now have we seen a team lose in the grand final and then capitulate the following year? Um, I think we're seeing it a lot more than what is just simply a coincidence. And so that loss in that grand final might have really hit them hard. Um, They might have just believed that they can do one better by improving their list. But it really felt like their midfield lost that jazz, lost that spark ever since 
Ashcroft went out of the side. I honestly can't believe how important Ashcroft, he's a great player, but he really has been very important to their team. And yes, I'm glad you picked up on that, guys. <laughs> so, I, I can't unsee it now, Fred. I can't unsee it. But, <laughs> but I mean, no, I agree with you. And we come on to, obviously, round two, zero and two for the Lions and the Pies. First time in AFL history, isn't it now, that the grand final final winners and losers are zero and two to start the season. It's a long way back. And there's a long way to go, it has to be said. But both sides, like we've mentioned tonight, have massive frailties. And especially, it feels a bit... It doesn't feel like Geelong last year, where Geelong were massively injured and massively Mm. underdone. You look at these two sides and take Kitty Coleman out. I don't count down Dan McStay for Brisbane, I mean, for Pies, because he wasn't there last year in their grand final run. So I look at both of these sides and think there's not that much excuses this is how tight we are now. Sides get better very quickly and learn your weaknesses. And I think why the Pies have lost in the Lions is just an extension of last year why they lost. Teams have worked it out and they've mastered it. And I don't think they've got better. I think they've just stayed the same level and everyone's gone up 10%. And I think one of these two, my bold call, one of these two sides misses the eight. That is a very bold call. A very, very bold call. But I can completely understand where you're coming from given the way that they've started this season. This form is horrendous form. It, it's it's terrible. It's not beating 95% of the competition, really. And so if you're going to if you're going to play that way, then yes, you're going to expect to lose. And if you're not on your game, any team on their day can beat you. And we've seen how close it is um, in the race for top four, the race for top eight last year. And this year, we only anticipated that it's going to get even tighter. So one extra dropped game here or there could have massive, massive ramifications on the makeup of the top eight. And um, I know you're not a big fan of the equalization of the AFL, but we can see that the competition is more equal than ever before in this year. And you know what? I think... It, despite it being a big call, I think it's an accurate call. One of these two teams will miss. Find it hard to imagine it will be Collingwood with that massive army that they've got trying to will them over the line. And you can't help but feel that Craig McRae will find a way to snap them back into gear because he's just such an incredible coach. I have more concerns over Brisbane, to be honest, than I do over, over Collingwood. I remember the 2017 Grand Final, and I will remember it very well because I was watching it with a Richmond mate. And he tried. He tried to sell a kidney on the black market to get tickets. That he ended up with me and a pies mate watching it in, in, in at his house. And I remember him being so happy. But I remember the take out of that. I felt like a part of Adelaide had died. And people forget 2017 Adelaide were insane. Like they were yeah. an insane side. Like you look at that forward line: Mitch McGovern, Tom Lynch, and Prime Tex with Jacobs just lowering the average good looks of that side. That was his job. But that next season, they looked like a part of them did die on the field. Take the off-field stuff off. They never were the same. I watched this Brisbane side, and I feel like the fear factor has been removed. And I feel like you take a little bit of energy from them, which they have, with Kitty Coleman going, I look at Brisbane and I think, you know what, you could be in trouble very quickly because I don't think the scars of being a rubbish side have fully healed yet and it's going to start remembering. And trust me, as a Carlton fan, the better we get, you never remove 2018 and they have their own version of 2018. Won't be far long before the fans getting on the back of them. I think they need more pressure, but the... But the virtue of them playing and being in Brisbane outside of that footy bubble probably allows them to sort of escape that scrutiny and that pressure that they otherwise would feel if they were in Victoria or if they were in South Australia. And that's part of the reason why we saw Joe Danaher, Judas Danaher, leave leave us, leave our team and betray the Danaher family name. So he, he went up to Brisbane because he didn't want to be in that footy bubble. He wanted to not have that pressure on him. He wanted to enjoy that 
scot-free, leisurely life of playing up in Brisbane. And so I'm not entirely sure that they're going to feel, I suppose, that pressure from the outside that, for example, a Collingwood might. Like if Collingwood goes 0-3, and three, losing to St Kilda, you know that every single article is going to be talking about the, the, the demise of Collingwood. Um, I'm not entirely sure just how much of a feedback they're going to get over in Brisbane. Yeah, I'm with you. I I, I, I feel like though just Collingwood are too well drilled. Like mm. I, I I think Collingwood most of their list has been there, done it. Do you know what I mean? Yep. They've, most of that list has recycled, been flag favourites, failing flag favourites. I look at Brisbane and I I see a vulnerability. And I agree with Jonas, they could do, but. Do you know what I mean? I, I look at St. Kilda and I, I think St. Kilda won't lie down this weekend. And then, you know, Brisbane versus Collingwood, it, I, I, I think that that's a big thing. I think if that game goes Collingwood's way, Brisbane will implode. That's their chance of redemption. And we saw it in 2017 when Richmond played Adelaide. That was like the final nail in the coffin. It was like the wounds mm. reopened. And everything went on. And before you knew it, they're having off-season camps where they're reenacting the Saw movie. Do you know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, I know, I know where you're coming from. But Fly has come in and he's he didn't, know, he, he didn't experience much pressure early on, I feel. And yet he was questioning everything. I don't know. I feel like when things start to turn really bad. If they lose to St. Kilda, I know they've got players who've been there, done that, but if they lose to St. Kilda, then I can't help but feel that there will be bells ringing. Alarm bells are ringing. Something's not right. How the hell we lose to St. Kilda? We've lost three in a row. Um, and then all of a sudden, your chances of making top four really slim down a lot. And they will feel the external pressure. I, I, they can't help but do so because this is the team that always comes back and wins the close games. This is the team that always has this belief in themselves. They've never had a reason to doubt. But doubt, once planted, can grow. And it grows quickly. And if it gets into the side, then all of a sudden... It, and we're seeing that doubt already in Brisbane. That's why we're seeing this sort of vulnerability in both of the teams. If doubt really takes root in both, then they could both miss the eight. Mate, it could be. It mate, it could be. It could be insane. And I mean, I, th I think GWS though is a good example of this. But I think mm. Carlton were playing for something. So were GWS, and it was kind of a what if they made the eight, and it was an expectation. I think mm. Brisbane and Collingwood were guaranteed top four, so the pressure yep. they're going to feel zero three zero four. He's kind of, there was always that out. I remember Carlton at 12, at round 12. People were like, it was always going to happen. It was always going to happen. That was the noise yeah. from the media. Carlton always let you down. GWS were going through a rebuild. I think Brisbane and Collingwood are the finished article. That There's no way for them to go. Correct. 100%. Uh, GWS... No one really appreciate a laughing magpie. I really do appreciate that. Much, much love, mate. Um, but with GWS, you can tell that they were they had to learn a new system. They had to learn under a new coach. Um, we heard that he wants to bring the orange tsunami back. Yeah, they had some teething complaints, but you could start to see it was turning gradually. And then they hit the ground running in the second half of the year and they went ballistic. I was definitely a lot more blown away with the turnaround from your mob, the Blues, because it was just going downhill so quickly and then it all just went into this common and this massive implosion after the game against us. And you really should have beaten us. That was a we, we did not play good. We just had that one little period in the third quarter where we kicked away, but we we not good enough. You guys should have smashed us. And we were without quite a few important midfielders. And you guys brought Kono to tag Merritt, which made no sense to me at the day. And obviously, you guys have spoken about it a lot. But you turned it around. It, it takes something special. And it, there has to be a lot of pain and a lot of soul searching before you can turn it around. I don't think Collingwood have had that. And it has to hit rock bottom before you can go back up again. You need to really have that 
burning through, renewal through the ashes in order to come out rejuvenated like your boys did last year. And Collingwood have been nowhere near it. They've had a very, they've been very lucky. I know they've won many games and obviously there's a skill to winning a lot of close games, but you can't take away the fact that they were lucky. Harrison Jones hit the post from 30 metres out. They go around, kick a goal. But if Harrison Jones kicks that goal, it's game over. Like how many games did they just get bailed out of? If things start to just tip the other way, momentum, negative momentum can build and then they can find themselves at rock bottom. Is it going to happen? Obviously, the jury's still out, but they haven't experienced it before. You guys have, and you've come out better for it. They haven't. I think it's going to be interesting. We're going to see what Fly is about. We know. I, I agree. I think Fly has had probably the easiest coaching tenure. Yep. I think if you look at Voss, everything Voss did, they criticised. I remember the noise about Adam Kingsley, like Jonas says, when they were four and eight. They were like, they had an experienced coach, Liam Cameron. They went with this untried guy. Is it backfiring? But Fly, he's always had. Now, I always use this short wins. Even though I believe winning is sustainable, I think it's the most ridiculous thing the media say. I yep. always say, look at David Teague in 2020, right? He, he If the games had finished at third quarter time by round 18, Carlton would have been fourth. Carlton yep. were what? Tenth. And you saw what happened. Them short games going against him, Carlton went down a hill and we imploded because of the negative energy. It's very interesting what happens if that starts happening again because Collingwood just haven't lost. They've been battered. And Brisbane, losing at the Gabba's a battering when, like you say, with Gold Coast, it's meant to be a fortress. Carlton broke the myth. Then Fremantle, it's meant to be a four-pointer. Fremantle are rubbish. They're struggling. Yep. They get, I, I think four or five goals is a battering in football. Yes. They're going to have some soul searching. They need it. And, it's, and Collingwood will need it too. If they lose at the MCG to the Saints, like you can say they've had a tough start to the year, the Pies, they've played against the Red Hot Giants over there. They've then played against the Swans who are in red hot form. So you can maybe say they've played against two top four caliber teams. But if they lose to the Saints, it's all happening. Hiroshima. Hiroshima. Oppenheimer football. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> this, is we- o- this is Opinema. Opinema. <laughs> about the and before we give our votes for everyone's favourite time, we finish with, is Bullish the Unvogue? We know every year there's something in Vogue. The AFL gets really excited about someone kicks the ball slightly different to someone else. Suddenly it's the new Vogue. But there does seem in these opening two rounds that bullish is coming into football. And you said something that really excited me earlier, Joe, that you think there's nothing sexier than bullish. I like bullish too. I like ugly, gritty. I think that's nice to watch. There seems to be a few teams expelling this. We saw Hawthorne do it. We saw your mob do it. We saw Cowton do it. We've seen GWS. They grinded that second quarter out when they really wrestled it. Are we starting to see we've had the fast, we've had the chaos ball, we've had the quick football. Are we starting to see a return of the old rugged be hard to beat? Because that seems to be something people forget. Being hard to beat is better than anything else. 100%. We're seeing it in spades. And I think the reason why we're seeing it is in spades is because I think that was what gave Collingwood the most the most issues last year. Being a tough team to beat, being in your face, winning the hard ball, getting it into your forward line, I think that's what Collingwood struggled with the most. And we said it earlier on in the piece, the, the, the premiers, they're the ones that get analysed to oblivion and they're the ones that put under the microscope, how can we get a leg up, what can we take from them um, to add to our team, what weapons can we take away from them and... I think playing that gritty hard ball in the middle, and especially against their midfield mix, it's very possible to do. And I think just being belligerent in the midfield, just dominating, locking the ball in your forward line, causing immense pressure, front half turnovers, that game is still very strong and hasn't been beaten. I know there's some teams that 
like to do that slingshot style. And I know Collingwood's one of those teams that love to play that slingshot style. But if you are really good enough at winning, that causing that front half turnover game, and you're fully bought into it, that kills the slick ball movement team. And I can't wait to see more of it this year. Pressure causes the slick ball movement to be too slick for your teammates, and you're hitting opposition on the chest with repeat set shots. We're seeing the big key forwards going absolutely ballistic to start this season. Mate, I'm enjoying football so much this year. I, I, I'm with you, and I, I think something sexy about 12 different styles. I've been covering the tactics and the analysation for about four years, and going back further, every side plays the same stupid way, in my opinion, <laughs> for them last last 10 years. You saw yep. Hawthorns run the ball out of bound for a behind, get the ball back at all costs, go quickly. You saw West Coast in between that Richmond era of that slow, methodical, almost a death by a thousand cuts. Then Richmond came with that real chaos -y style, just get the ball forward. We're going to score a goal more than you. We don't care about defence. Geelong reinvented the boring method of calm, calm. Then you saw Rick Collingwood. They came with just chaos, didn't they? Chaos. We'll, we'll piss about for three quarters, and the fourth quarter, <laughs> we'll just run at, run at you as hard as we can. And then you're starting to see it, that teams are starting to be a bit more tactical. And I know speaking to a few coaching line coaches in the AFL, they're starting to put a lot of money into that. And we're really starting to see more of a European football, that teams are now tailoring the game to what they've got. And I'll use Khan as an example. If we tried to play like Geelong, we'd lose by 100 because our players can't kick. Our players mm. can't thread sexy 53-meter passes through a cluster. Yeah, do you know what I mean? <laughs> so it makes sense. Right, what are you guys? You're fit, you're big, you're strong. Okay, we'll play territory, and then we'll be 12 versus 4 at all times. We'll block them in, and we'll make them play. And I thought your comment and Peter's pressure is better than slick ball movement because I'm a big boxing man. And mm. it's amazing how sexy someone looks in the first round dancing around. And then you see if they try that when they get lamped in the face in round four. It changes. And you see that in sport. Quickly, it changes, doesn't it? When a side is under 200 rate in pressure, see how sexy you kick then. I've learned this lesson the hard way following my mob for however as for as long as I have because we haven't been a high-pressure side for a long time we've we've been a sexy ball movement out of the back line and it's always backfired on us and that's not the type of game style that holds up in finals when you think finals football you, you you're talking about that high pressure in and under gritty you're busting your balls in order to get the ball moving forward you're you're putting your body on the line that that's what it takes in order to win outside slick ball movement just isn't the way to go. You do need some players that are capable of moving the ball forward and breaking a line here or there. Absolutely. You do. I'm not saying every single person has to be purely contested. Like Melbourne had problems with that in the past. Everyone was too much in an under sea ball, get ball. You need to have players like your Cherries, like your acres, like your Walsh's who can play on the outside and, and, and carve up some lines um, getting the ball from your Hewitts and your Crippers. So you need to have that balance in order to get it across the line. So for me, I'm really excited to see where this season takes us um, in terms of some of this contested ball. I know that's, Melbourne does that really well, and they've added some outside players like Billings and, and, um, and Caleb Windsor. I reckon this kid's going to be a Jet. So... I'm really keen to see how these teams are going to find that balance between contested ball and outside uh, in order to get the ball moving quickly to their forward line. So it's it's going to be really interesting. I don't think the season has started anywhere near as exact um, as everyone thought it was going to start. I'm sure there's been a lot of false tips, a lot of wrong tips at the start of this season, and that just yeah. makes it even more intriguing. I love this from Jonas as well. I think it really plays into that narrative of pressure like, I, I said this on the review of the Carlton game against Brisbane. If you analyse that game of who played better football, you'd say Brisbane, right? Mm. You'd say Brisbane. Brisbane were the better football side. 
from a yep. purist point of view. But my f- ending words of my review were Carlton did what they did better than what Brisbane did, which resulted in Brisbane's one wood becoming a pitching wedge. And you saw this with Carlton versus Melbourne. The pressure, it got to them. Collingwood, they out-pressured them. But as a pound-for-pound pound football side, I think it would be fair to say Melbourne should have beaten both Carlton in that final and Collingwood, especially when they got on the upper. And GWS, they played that real sexy brand. The pressure got to them in the moment. It's interesting that I remember last year going to a function and Voss said it's about treating regular season games like their finals. Pressure, mm. pressure, pressure, furnace, furnace, furnace. So when you play in a final, it's not, oh my God, this is the first final. And Correct. you kind of saw that week out and they were used to it. And I do look at my boys, not being biased. I think our game plan is just another day in paradise for us a final now. Like how we play won't well, surprise us when there's a hundred thousand people screaming. That that's how we play. We we containing for Carlton is pulling out the peanuts at half time. We don't know what containing is. Yeah, hundred percent. And that's you know, um practice what you preach and practice makes perfect and um pressure makes diamonds, you know what I mean? So it's all all these wonderful catchphrases and slogans and cliches can all be applied but at the end of the day it's what you what you do every day on a regular basis you get used to it you drill it into yourself in that dna and that's sort of what's helped teams like the swans that bloods culture you know those belligerent um nose to the grindstone type of teams can really be able to to pressure you and get you into finals thanks sars um much love really appreciate it um we'll definitely yeah, get I, I, back. I he's one of my faves one of my faves oh, you're making me blush bro come on don't do this to me on a 10 16 p.m night i'll get a big head but yeah no i i can't wait to see how the pressure of various teams apl- is, is applied and i think melbourne as great as they are they apply pressure on themselves with bad kicking in front of the big sticks and bad kicking is bad football, unfortunately. And so part of their it's part so that's their say. that's their problem for a long time. So they say. Uh, we 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 hear it a lot. We do hear it a lot. But we come to everyone's favourite. We've got the Pombardi Trophy. <laughs> this is this is this is the real real trophy. Like any anyone can win a Brownlow. Do you know what I mean? Anyone can yeah. win. The, the, the Players Association, the Pombardi Trophy is where it's at. And where are we? Here we are. I think it's this one. There we are. It, from last week, the wonderful Riles Macker gave his five votes with Pom's votes. And we can see Matty Rao, Mackay lead the way. Brody Grundy had four. Heaney had three. We might have been stiff on him. Bearing in mind, Riles is a Sydney fan. So... Uh, there you are. Foggy, green and brown make up for it. But joining them this week is your votes and mine. So who was your one vote? Give us your one vote for the weekend and chat. you throw yours in. I'm going to chuck one vote to Jesse Hogan. He's kicked six goals against North Melbourne. Now, I know they are not the best forward line, but if you kick six goals in a game and look as dangerous as he did, even gave up a few here and there, uh, 100%, hit the likes up, guys, hit the thumbs up. I am going to give it, I'm going to give the one vote to Jesse Hogan. If it was against tougher opposition with a tougher back line, I might have given him more, but I'm going to give the one vote to the big, uh, to big Jesse. Oh, mate, I, I agree. He is in my votes, but I went with a comeback story this week. And I went with Clayton Oliver. I, mm-hmm. I thought the scrutiny he's had in the off season. I've been quite public. I thought Melbourne's support during all them rumours was shocking as well. I thought him to come back and him tear the game open and be back to his best was beautiful to see. So I gave him... The one vote, so he joins us that. On your two votes, who are you giving? Given my two votes, I'm giving it 
I did think of giving it to Haney, but I'm going to give Haney more votes. I'm actually going to give the two votes to Patrick Cripps this week. I think, I think he really stood up against against the Tigers, who did really well in the midfield against your boys. Um, things were looking pretty dicey. I'm sure it was very close to comfort for you watching it. I'm sure you had your heart in your mouth for your pommy watch alongs, but I think Cripper had a I think I think Cripper had a great game on the weekend. I'm gonna give him the two votes for me. Mate, mate, uh, you know what? I'm the Carlton fan. I didn't give Cripps two votes. I didn't give him my votes. I feel like I've betrayed betrayed him, but no, I agree. I and thought you. he was sensational. Um and absolutely phenomenal in it. I'm glad someone who's not a blue bagger gave him the love because I feel like he he deserves more love. I think he's I think he's on five minimum five brown low votes. Exactly. And I just feel like it's not fair. Cause I know I do it with my team as well. Like sometimes when I'm like thinking thinking back and reviewing a game. And I'd be like, oh yeah, he was great as usual, and sort of just pass throw it under the rug. But just because someone's good doesn't necessarily mean that you're not supposed to acknowledge him when they do perform really well still. Like, don't take it for granted that just because he's a good player, he's expected to play well because they're human beings at the end of the game as well, at the end of the day, and they, they could have an off day. So I think where a, a captain inspirational does an inspirational thing and performs really well, I think they should still get their kudos and give him a little bit of pep in their step. Mate, I love it. Well, I mean, my two votes, I went with Jesse Hogan. Because I'm a sucker for the <laughs> comeback story. I've got a real comeback story feel to my votes. But three votes. Who did you go with, Mr. Joe? I've, I've gone three votes to... I'm going to go Tom Green for my three votes this week. I think he had... Uh, I think the stats just speak for itself, really. Um, how incredible of a performance he had against the young North Melbourne Brigade, who are going to be absolutely wonderful when they continue to develop and get some more games under their belt. But I think uh, I think Tom Green was an absolute machine. Mate, the last t- time Tom Green's been this popular was the 90s with weird <laughs> rap songs. Um, I agree with you. He, he was sensational. The GWS, honestly, you know what? Seeing a young kid, because he is a young kid, be the main man in the midfield is gonna is absolutely gorgeous to me. Do you know what I mean? Is absolutely yeah. gorgeous. It's what the game's about and phenomenal performance. But my three votes, another comeback kid, Isaac Heaney. I I, I thought Heaney again was sensational and stiff not to get the five. I said it last week when I didn't give him five. I gave him three last as well. I just think his uh, performance this week was just fantastic. I just felt there was more exciting ones. More exciting ones. Who's your four? Fair enough. I'm giving the four to Heaney. I'm giving the four to Heaney. I think, I think Heaney was. To, I, I'm not reading this comment. Um, it's because I've already read the comment and I read the comment <laughs> above. Um, yeah. Thanks. Thanks, Jason. Much, much, much love, bro. Um, <laughs> but yeah, no. I'm, I'm going Heaney. I'm going Heaney for the four. I think he was just a class above. And he really needs he, he needs the plaudits. I think I think his performance last week, in addition to this week, I think he needs to get more than three. I'm going four for Heaney. Mate, I love it. I went four for Matty Rao, the grass eating genius. I thought uh, watching him is great to see because I think the, I think a lot of people misunderstand the injury he had. Do you know what I mean we've seen players miss a beat, and then last year he probably wasn't at his prime. Do you know what I mean? And there was them questions, wasn't there? Is he going to reach them heights? But he's come back with a bang and he looks every part of the height that was there. And that that midfield, him and Anderson, probably one of my favourite midfields to watch at the minute. Like, they play some good football between them. I love watching Matty Rowe. 100%. No, nah, he's, he's an absolute superstar. I feel, I feel kind of bad that I haven't got him in my votes. Nah, it's all good, Jason, bro. As as Jonas has said, now Jonas is a regular at our at, on our channel. We do love to give each other some shit all the time. It's all banter. I love to give it out, and don't you worry. I have copped my fare over many many years. 
and it's all in good fun. Banter, banter's part of the game, guys. Uh, well done. Very. I'm glad that you're comfortable enough to have some banter with me for as a first time participant on the stream. So thank you very much for fe- making me feel very welcome. We do love Joe Chat. We do love him. And five votes. This could be important. Who are you pinging it to? It's got to be Sarong. It's got to be Sarong for me. I- I'm with you as well. And like Sarong has, he's, he- he's shot up these rankings, getting the maximum 10 being the first man to do it. But t- talk to me about his game. What did you like about it? Bro, I mean, what wasn't there to like about it? I mean, he had what? He had the 25 disposals to half time. You know what I mean? Like he was, and he kick-started off the game um, almost immediately in the second quarter, in the third quarter, sorry, um, exactly where he left off. It really looked like he was on track for 50. It was absolutely remarkable. And he did it, like, it's not just a simple, you know, massive disposal game where you just accumulate a lot on the outside. He had 21 contested possessions, if you don't mind, to go with it, um, and and that was absolutely wonderful. Seven tackles, so he did he he did the hard in the hard work both ways, winning the football and tackling as well. So he both sides of the game, absolutely wonderful. He had like 86 percent time on ground or something like that as well. So it wasn't like he, you know, had little bursts. It was a sustained effort and nothing. And the, the Lions had absolutely nothing that they could do to stop him. They tried to send Dev Robertson onto him, but he still went along his merry way. Can't believe it. This kid is going to be an absolute superstar. Mate, I think you've nailed it. And it means Matt Rowe, with just one more round in this month, so it's a short round, this first round, He's leading with 13 votes from Isaac Heaney and Sarong comes out of nowhere to be on 10 votes apiece, being Harry Mackay and Tom Green rounded up the top five. It's going to be an interesting vote because whoever's on next week potentially could give someone the trophy. But at the moment, it's Matt Rowell's and uh, Mr. Heaney and Sarong's to lose. So, big week. Big week. It makes sense that these are the inside mids. And we've been talking about it so much today that we love the nitty-gritty, non-sexy football. We love the brutality, winning at the cold face and taking the ball forward. That's that's what we both love. And it makes and it's no surprise that that is being acknowledged not just by us, but by your other guests that you've had before me. So it's um, it's really cool to see that we're us here in this landscape are really appreciating, I suppose, the in and under old school type of football. And it should be this time next week. My friend has finished casting us the Pombardi Trophy. He is Ooh. making one that lives behind me and one that hopefully we can get to the winner of the Pod Bardi Trophy. Um, he's found a very funny picture to have on the uh, placard instead of the NFL logo, which was nice of him. So hopefully we can live, we can get a video of giving that out to someone. That'll be quite good. I'm sure the players are right now are saying MVP who. It's all about the Pod Bardi. This is a lot harder to win, this one. It's a lot harder to win. But Joe, tell me, what if the lovely members of this audience want to go out and find Mr. Joe and feel his vibes, where would these crazy people go? You crazy mofos who barracks for Carlton. Uh, it feels, you know, despite being some rivals here, it's been an absolute wonderful time. Thank you so much for having me on, guys. Um, it's been absolutely wonderful. You can find me at the Centre Bounce uh, where we are a mostly AFL super coach content creation video on YouTube. We um, we do occasionally do some general football stuff, but it's mostly super coach Big J and myself are the two presenters there. I am also found on Fancast as well. Uh, we do weekly videos as well, talking about football, um, some reviews of the games, predictions for the games to come and things like that. So um, 
hopefully you can chuck me a follow there on both of those two uh, platforms. Jonas, you're an absolute superstar, and I freaking love it that you continue to give me shit all the way over here as well on the Pomyonos channel. So um, much love, guys. Thank you so much. My Twitter is chabby underscore Joe, um, and you're more than welcome to chuck me a follow there as well. They are chat. I've put Mr. Joe's wonderful, wonderful details in there. So go and give him a follow. Go and say hey from the Pommy crew. We love Joe. He will be a regular this year because, honestly, Joe is a dream to work with. And I'm getting old and I have kids, so having (laughs) dreams to work with makes it a bit easier in my R&R. But Joe, mate, wish you all the best. For those watching... We have another dream to work with on Wednesday. We have the gorgeous Lack Dog. We're playing a little game with you guys where you will be blind picking a cow and combined team of the 2013 prelim side and the 2023 prelim side. And all you will have will be random numbers where you're going to have to work out the best player statistically in your opinion. And we won't tell you. So we've made it very cruel. And there could be some mistakes, like Robbie Warnock is the starting Ruckman. Stay tuned. I have no idea who Robbie Warnock is. (laughs) Stay tuned, everyone. Make sure you go and take Joe out. Thank you. God bless. Love you all. See you next time. Pom. Bye, guys.